On the night of February 6, 1951, one of the worst train derailments in history would occur. It happened right on NJ Transit's busy North Jersey coastline here in the town of Woodbridge, New Jersey. Every day, NJ Transit trains make their stops in Woodbridge, New Jersey, either heading down to the shoreline or heading into the big city. Originally part of the Pennsylvania Railroad's New York and Long Branch section, Woodbridge, New Jersey has been home to many changes, and it's also been home to many historic events. One of which being Train 733's horrible accident, otherwise known as the broker derailment. At around 5 p.m. on Tuesday, February 6, 1951, Pennsylvania Railroad Train number 733 left Exchange Place in Jersey City and was an express train to Bayhead via the North Jersey coastline. 733 was crowded that day due to a strike on the Jersey Central Railroad and stockbrokers, bankers, secretaries, homemakers, and many more people on board the train making for a cross-section of people and professions. Over 1,000 passengers were on train 733, otherwise known as the Broker. The consist was made up of 11 P-70 coaches pulled by K-4 Pacific 2445. The weather that day was mild with precipitation, making for an on and off drizzle. The crew inside 2445 was engineer Joseph Fitzsimmons and fireman Patty Dunn. Before the train left Exchange Place, the head conductor, John Bishop, reminded Fitzsimmons of a ghost slow order that was put in effect at 1 p.m. on the same day. The go slow order was put into place as turnpike workers would be on scene and that the traffic would be diverted onto a temporary third track and that speed restriction of 25 miles per hour would be put in effect. As train 733 left Newark Penn Station, all was going well and there hadn't been any incident since the train departed Exchange Place. Sooner rather than later, the train began coming up on the curve at Woodbridge. The rain was pounding down hard. As the train began getting closer near Woodbridge, engineer Joseph Fitzsimmons caught himself off guard and found himself going a little faster than he wanted to. Fitzsimmons began applying the brakes, however the train kept going down the line and increasing in speed. Because of the wet rails due to the pouring rain, the train was slipping, causing it to not slow down. The train began to violently shake as it went around the Conductor Bishop grabbed and pulled down the emergency cord for protection. However, it was too late. Train 733 plows down the embankment. The fireman, Patty Dunn, was instantly killed on impact of the K-4 hitting the ground. The passenger cars did not fare any better. The P-70 coaches violently twisted as they were torn apart, crushing passengers. The sound of metal tearing shrieked throughout the town. In the first few minutes after the crash, the air was quiet with no sounds at all. However, soon, the moaning and chilling screams of passengers from the tangled mess of metal filled the air with horror. A few of the P-70 coaches dangled over Legion Place. Many of the passengers believed that they had crashed over a river, and so seeing the wet road below them, they jumped from the cars for their lives. However, their attempts to save themselves only got them killed as they hit the ground headfirst, instantly dying. The Woodbridge Fire and Police Department, along with several EMT squads, were the first to show up to the crash site, where they found that their rescue efforts were going to be a challenge because of the money and bankmen. Ladders were used to get to the passenger cars and to rescue anyone trapped inside. First responders from at least 20 neighboring communities in Woodbridge all came out to assist with the rescue efforts. Perth Amboy General Hospital went into full disaster mode as they began receiving patients from the broker crash. A local grocery store in town had to press in their trucks for use as ambulances and then later as hearses. 
To make matters worse, a crowd had formed around the crash site, making entrance and exits very difficult for first responders. The situation got so bad that former New Jersey Governor Alfred Driscoll had the New Jersey National Guard mobilized for crowd control. The guardsmen stood side by side, arms linked in a human chain, after which the rescue and recovery efforts moved forward at a rapid pace. The National Guard also stayed after the recovery efforts to keep looters from getting to the crash site and stealing anything for collectibles. Many houses just outside of the broker crash site were opened and used as makeshift hospitals. One story recounts that cotton balls were given to children in order to keep their ears shut from any chilling screams downstairs. Eventually, the victims who had passed away were pulled out of the train cars and brought to the Woodbridge Fire Department as it was used as a temporary morgue. Many of the train cars were being cut up and prepared for movement back to a shop for evaluation. Workers at the crash site had to clean out any wreckage and unfortunately any remains from victims. One first responder remembers pulling what he thought was an article of clothing from one of the passenger cars. However, upon closer examination, he had been pulling a victim's torso out. When he realized this, he left the train car and quit his job over what he had witnessed. There was still one question left that had to be answered. How did this happen? And why? The FBI opened an investigation to see if sabotage was the answer for the train wreck. However, they soon closed the investigation after finding that there was no evidence of such. The Interstate Commerce Commission and the Pennsylvania Railroad both opened their own investigations, including the Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office. The Pennsylvania Railroad immediately put all the blame on Joseph Fitzsimmons. However, the Interstate Commerce Commission pointed out to the Pennsylvania Railroad that nobody had inspected to make sure that a speedometer was in 2445 and there wasn't one. The ICC also found out that the Pennsylvania Railroad never gave out a go-slow order. In fact, they never installed yellow warning lights or a signal showing a change in speed ahead or a signal to show an unexpected change in the track condition. As for the Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office, they found fault with the PRR as well for the accident as it was discovered that the PRR had a company safety rule that yellow signals must be installed at all go slow areas, regardless of paper notices posted in the offices. It was further discovered that the PRR branch they operate along had a practice of ignoring the rule. Forget about it. The assistant prosecutor voiced outrage that the PRR was using Fitzsimmons as a scapegoat. Fitzsimmons brought 85 counts of manslaughter against the PRR, however the charges were later dropped when it was determined that the cost of the court proceedings would bankrupt the county. In the end, all parties agreed to an out-of-court settlement. Fitzsimmons would never operate a train on the Pennsylvania Railroad again. As for the standard railroad of the world, they showed that their only standard was ignoring safety rules and putting people's lives in danger. One year after the accident, the area looked a lot different than it did on that horrid night. The bridge area was rebuilt and all wreckage and evidence of the crash had been removed and the trains were back on track. 2445 was extensively damaged, but was overhauled and returned back into service to eventually get to be retired and scrapped. As for the P-70 coaches, it's believed that they were all overhauled and returned back into service as well. In preparation for the first anniversary of the crash, a group of survivors requested that the rush hour train would stop at the side of the crash just before 6pm for a brief ceremony to commemorate the loss of life. Administrators at the Pennsylvania Railroad denied the request, and instead, the group stood at the rear of the train and threw out a spray of 85 flowers onto the tracks as it neared the crash site. One flower for each life that was lost. In 2002, New Jersey Transit revealed a dedication plaque for the victims of the broker crash, and in 2013, Woodridge Township revealed their own. It's been 70 years since that horrible night on February 6, 1951. However, thanks to innovations such as positive train control, it's safe to say that New Jersey transit commuters don't have to worry about any event like this happening. Although the wreckage is gone and there's barely any trace of the wreck, the memories and the accident itself is not forgotten.